Good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Keyboard and Mouse, Little Objects, Big Impact. I'm Stephanie from WorkSafe Tasmania and also the coordinator of WorkSafe Tasmania Month. I'll also be your moderator for this morning's webinar. Before we do get started though, I'd appreciate you taking a few moments to read the following slide about information delivered during WorkSafe Month webinars. I'd now like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in uh, this morning's uh, presentation. So we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer screen in the upper right corner. You're most likely listening in using your computer speaker system by default. However, if you'd prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and uh, the dialing information will be displayed. You'll also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing in your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect and address these questions uh, at the end of today's webinar, but do, as I said, uh, send them in during the presentation if there are any questions that, um, that uh, come to mind. We are also recording the webinars over WorkSafe Tasmania Month and will progressively make those webinars available at the end of WorkSafe Month on the 30th of October on the WorkSafe Tasmania website. And uh, lastly, before you do leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate uh, you completing that survey and providing your feedback about your webinar experience and also about uh, this morning's webinar. So I would now like to uh, hand you over to this morning's uh, presenters from the Tasmanian Ergonomic Collaborative to present uh, this morning's uh, webinar, Keyboard and Mouse, Little Objects, Big Impact. Welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, hello and welcome to our presentation, Keyboard and Mouse, Little Objects, Big Impact. This is Daniela and I will be walking you through the main body of the presentation, assisted by Bernadette on the slides and Marie with some pause exercises. Both Liz and Marie will be answering any questions that you may have at the end. This presentation is aiming to discuss the changes to our work practices that the use of mobile technology has brought about. Mobile devices have introduced new ergonomic problems due to the rapid evolution of new technology and constant change. There is no one right answer to managing these. However, what we are attempting to do today is explain some of the common problems and issues and give you some guidelines for minimising the impact. Just before we continue, please note the following. So let's begin. Today's presentation is going to cover the following key points. What is mobile technology? How has mobile technology changed the way we work? How is it affecting our musculoskeletal health and work performance? And minimising the impact recommendations for survival. So. What is mobile technology? Have a look at that list. I am sure that there are many amongst us that regularly use two or three of these devices. Some of us probably have more than one of these in our handbags or work satchels. In June 2014, Gartner, who are the world's leading information technology research and advisory company, projected that in 2015, tablet sales will exceed PC and desktop sales for the first time. 
This will see tablet sales increase by 18 times in five short years. They further predicted that the sale of mobile phones will reach 1.95 billion worldwide this year. So mobile technology is influencing our lives at a rapid and ever-growing pace. So how has mobile technology changed the way we work? Mobile technology has reduced incidental physical activity. What does this mean? It means that paperless offices have caused us to adopt prolonged static postures. That is, postures where we do not move. We are now no longer mixing up our physical work tasks with stationary computer work. Previously, we would have undertaken filing, photocopying and printing, attending meetings both on and off site, mail collation, envelope stuffing and posting, attending the bank and the post office at the beginning or end of each day, reading hard copy documents that have arrived in the mail or by courier. And all of these activities provided us with opportunity to move and vary our postures more. Conversely, use of technology has increased our potential to be productive by allowing us to complete work tasks during our commute and by sharing our files and folders instantly, as well as calendars and email accounts between the devices and the office. It has increased our availability to others by enabling us to be contactable wherever we are and it has also created an expectation that we can now respond more quickly outside of standard office space and hours. So we are now contactable 24-24 and we're using a range of products and gadgets to remain productive, in touch, available, flex. Opinions are likely to vary with regards to whether this is a good or bad thing. However, what is clear is that work practices have changed as a result of the introduction of mobile technology and these gadgets that we are becoming increasingly reliant on are having an impact on our health and wellbeing. Which leads us to question, how exactly is it affecting our musculoskeletal health and work performance? Musculoskeletal and musculoskeletal disorders, also known as MSDs, are injuries or pain in the body's joints, ligaments, muscles, nerves, tendons, and structures that support the limbs, neck, and back. MSDs can be degenerative diseases and inflammatory conditions that cause pain and impair normal activities. Symptoms can range from a feeling of fatigue or discomfort to tightness, heaviness, pulling, throbbing, burning, dragging, even pins and needles and numbness. When one body part fatigues, the other body parts become affected as the body will use nearby muscle groups and soft tissues to compensate for the discomfort or altered function. The old song, the wrist bone is connected to the arm bone and the arm bone is connected to the elbow bone and so on, describes the way the body works in a biomechanical sense. We have a series of interconnected muscles, tendons and soft tissues. So what starts as wrist pain can soon become elbow, shoulder and even neck pain or vice versa, as the body spreads the load and different muscles and soft tissues this also explains why a person might have shoulder blade pain, but the cause can be the way they use their hands. Pain and discomfort reduces productivity and has other knock-on effects which we will describe now. The neck is very vulnerable to pain and discomfort from sitting hunched over for prolonged periods. If you find yourself rubbing your neck after sitting, you may need to think about your posture before continuing with the activity. A survey of university students and staff found that individuals rarely used a tablet propped on a stand. Rather, they would often position the tablet in their lap as shown in this picture. Just pause for a minute. Is this typically what you look like when using your tablet? Or is this you when you're texting on a mobile phone? Consider this neck position. The position we adopt has an impact on the discomfort that we experience. The position on the left is one that many of us adopt every day, multiple times per day. 
Hunching over laptops, tablets and mobile phones is something that we see people doing every day. Hunching over not only impacts on back and neck discomfort, but typically the shoulders also round forward, which subsequently causes that niggle of pain that you have, may have felt between your shoulder blades. You may ask how reading off a device differs from reading a book. When reading a book, people generally move more. Think about yourself, what do you do? Do you alternate hands to hold the book? Do you move your whole arm to turn a page? Do you tilt your head between pages? Now think about using your Kindle, laptop or tablet. What sort of movements do you use when you need to swipe a finger or hit the enter key? People often remain hunched over for lengthy periods when using these mobile devices. Professor Alan Hedge of Cornell University Ergonomics Program in his work reported that hunching over doubles the compressive forces in the lower back compared to leaning back 20 degrees against support which relaxes and halves the compression forces. The mantra is, sit back and relax, do not sit forward and hunch. Micro damage of the soft tissue structures can occur if a poor spinal position is maintained for long periods of time, which can then lead to an inflammatory response and pain. Wrist, hand and finger pain is another common complaint. Repetitive movements and awkward postures can lead to overuse injuries in the hand and arm. The reliance on thumbs for texting has led to an upsurge of tendon related conditions. For example, de Quervain's tenosynovitis or trigger thumb, which have also been termed Blackberry thumb, text thumb or Nintendo thumb. Tendons are the structures that transfer the movement from the fingers to the muscles in the forearms and rapid texting or using awkward thumb and finger positions may risk tendonitis, which is essentially inflammation of the tendon. Safe Work Australia in the Code of Practice for Hazardous Manual Tasks identify repetitive movement and awkward postures as risk factors for developing musculoskeletal disorders and these include tendon injuries. In this situation, tendonitis is considered an overuse injury and presents with symptoms including pain, swelling, numbness and weakness. Subtle changes to the structures, including inflammation, may occur as a response to overuse before symptoms are felt. The earlier symptoms of joint pain in our hands may be triggered by activities that involve pinch grips. When we use the handheld communication devices, we grip them. Pain when opening jars, doorknobs, car doors or turning keys are symptoms that may indicate the beginning of an injury. Effects can be worse in those more susceptible to inflammation and pain, which includes older adults or people with existing inflammatory conditions, for example arthritis and fibromyalgia. Typing on a solid surface increases static shoulder muscle activity and wrist extension and can also lead to sore fingertips from tapping on the solid surface. There is some trade-off to be considered when using laptops and tablets in an inclined configuration. Asundi and his team identified that improvements in head and neck postures can be made in mobile computing environments by increasing the angle of the support surface. However, there was a trade-off as increasing the incline of the device also increased wrist extension. They concluded that improvements and trade-offs for a 12 degree incline appeared to be acceptable, although this position was not intended to be sustained for long periods. In simple terms, this means creating a balance between looking down at the screen when it is not adjustable and having the hands and wrists in an acceptable position for keying. An incline of 12 degrees allows for typing with the hands slightly but not excessively lifted in relation to the forearms, whilst the head does not have to look down to read the screen as sharply as when the device is sitting flat on the desktop. Of course, the, in, the ideal situation and one to consider if using the device for prolonged periods is to have a separate keyboard or screen so the two can be adjusted independently without compromising either neck or wrist posture but more on that later in this presentation. An older, older statistic but a horrifying increase 
A Virgin Mobile study in 2006 found that reports of sore thumbs and wrists increased by 38% in a five year span. So on to visual health. Our posture becomes driven by details such as font size. Small size fonts equals small working distances. We automatically adjust our posture in order to be able to read what we see. So we are more likely to close the distance by peering and hunching to read smaller font. Did you need to move forward to read the smaller sentence on this screen? What did it say? The eyes typically lead the body. Think how close you have to bring your phone to your eyes to view text. Typically, we do not walk around with a magnifying glass in our pockets. Jennifer Long is a key resource in this area. She is both an ergonomist and an optometrist and the current sitting president of the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society of Australia. Jennifer writes a monthly newsletter with useful information on visual ergonomics and details of her website will be provided at the end of the presentation. Consider the size of fonts and images on a laptop screen. These are typically smaller than that on our widescreen LED monitors. How many of you routinely work on spreadsheets and databases using your regular PC and widescreen monitor and report difficulty viewing the small font size? This is a typical issue reported to us as we undertake ergonomic assessments. A laptop or tablet makes everything significantly smaller all of the time. Therefore, if trying to work with large or complex documents on a tablet or laptop, the strain is even greater. And typically, our need to zoom the screen in and out increases significantly. Your hands want to be close to your body, but your eyes want to focus on something two feet in front of you. And if you already have underlying visual problems, the higher visual demands are likely to make the visual problems more noticeable. Do you suffer from any of these symptoms? Also, it is worth considering the type of glasses worn and the impact that these may have on neck posture. For example, if you wear multifocal lenses, how much bobbing is your head doing? Are you trying to find a sweet spot to see writing on a screen or peering over your glasses when reading off the screen of your tablet or phone, thereby further compromising your neck position? So how is it affecting our work performance? As mentioned in 24, if we choose to be, enabling us to be able to make decisions and deal with issues that arise in real time. We have greater access to information in terms of content and quality and in a timely manner wherever we are. As an aside, and in reference to the photo on the right, no, I would not advocate using any electronic device that close to a water source or in full sun or for prolonged periods or without some back support. But in all seriousness, it has enabled greater access for rural and remote areas and the gains in collaboration and networking have been significant and we have reduced the amount of time spent on data entry, which has been especially relevant for those working off-site and in the field. However, there are a few negatives which directly affect our productivity at work. Typing is slower and is of no surprise because of the lack of tactile feedback from the keys, as well as the size of the virtual keys. Both contribute to increasing the probability of errors. When using a virtual keyboard, we do not receive feedback from our fingertips. There is no tactile response that tells us we have depressed the key sufficiently to know we have typed a single letter. All we have is a visual feedback on the screen that lets us know that we have been successful in typing one letter or even the correct letter. As for key size, how many of us struggle to type a message on mobile phones with those teeny tiny keys? Thank goodness for predictive text, right? Types of a virtual keyboard will result in slower keying performance as visual feedback is required before continuing to type. Using a virtual keyboard is therefore unlikely to be productive if used for prolonged 
periods. Pain and discomfort. Pain is a significant factor. Think back to when you last experienced physical discomfort. Perhaps you are experiencing some now. What about having the cold or flu this winter? How productive were you and where was your focus? Distraction and multitasking. The notion of presenteeism, which means being fully focused and fu functioning on the job at hand, is now being applied to the increased min mental effort from distraction and multitasking that is caused by the access to and use of mobile technology. For example, as messages or emails arrive, we can be driven to provide an immediate response. Or some of us may have a habit for checking social media regularly or actioning tasks as they come to mind. For example, I must pay the water bill. And because I can do this easily from my mobile, I do for fear of forgetting later. But at what expense to the task I was working on? Psychological consequences. Not only does the ability to work productively have financial consequences for our businesses, employers and colleagues, it also has psychological consequences and is associated with feelings of reduced job satisfaction and self-worth. Interestingly, one study I read proposes that we are reducing our capacity for critical thinking because of the availability of Mr Google in our pocket. What impact is this likely to have on innovation and creativity and therefore our work performance? There is sufficient evidence to suggest that the use of mobile technology devices are affecting our rest and sleep. Dr Mariana Figaro, who is the Director of Light and Health Program at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York, suggests that using an iPad at full brightness for two hours is enough to trigger melatonin suppression, which optimises wakefulness. Her research did not find similar effects from watching TV or using a standard desktop computer, speculating that the reason for differences was that these devices are less bright and not situated as close to our seated position. For those of you unfamiliar with the hormone melatonin, it assists in regulating our sleeping and waking cycle and is influenced by the amount of light that we are exposed to. Dr Sarah Lochran from the Australian Centre for Electromagnetic Bioeffects Research reported the following implications of pre-bedtime use of mobile technology. Delayed bedtimes, therefore less time available for sleep before having to get up the next day. Increased brain stimulation and excitement, making it more difficult to fall asleep. And nighttime sleep being disrupted disrupted by incoming alerts and messages, or even by individuals checking the phone when waking during the night. How big an issue is this really? Well, in 2013, the National Sleep Foundation in the US commissioned a survey to understand the effects that bedroom environments have on sleep. They found that more than 50% of respondents used a computer, laptop or tablet in the hour before bed. This was in addition to the use of smartphones before bed, during the night, when waking, and first thing in the morning. So now to recap. The use of smaller and smaller mobile devices has increased significantly in five years. Mobile devices have changed the way we work. We are more accessible and less physically active. Use of devices are impacting on our experience of pain and discomfort. And our performance on work tasks is directly and indirectly affected. So whilst mobile technology is an important part of our day-to-day -day lives, there are both benefits and costs in its ability to support our productivity and well-being. Is this what the future looks like? Names that have been applied include the smartphone tribe or even the head down zombies. Or are we creating a new syndrome for the medical journals? Okay. What position is your neck in? Is your hand propping up your chin? Have you got your head in your hands? Are you peering at the screen? Is your head forward of your body? Where are your shoulders? Are they rounded in and in front of your body? Are you hunching forward? Do you have any lumbar support 
or are you perching on the front of your seat with no backrest in sight? So before we go any further, here is a good opportunity to learn some pause and postural break exercises. I'll hand over to Marie for these. So, so let's have a micro break right now. Firstly, can you stand up? Right, once you're standing, try rolling your shoulders. Thing back and down, going in the opposite direction of the way that the work drives you forward. Roll your shoulders gently in little circles, up, back and down. Try using one shoulder and then the other shoulder and see if you get a greater range of movement in your upper back doing this. Try shrugging your shoulders up towards your ear, but focus on the letting go, letting them drop down, trying to let them feel relaxed. Squeeze your shoulder blades back and try to draw them gently together so they meet in the middle of your back. Squeeze back, hold for a few seconds and let go. Now for your arms. Try raising your arms up to shoulder height and out to the sides of your body and draw small circles with your fingertips. Holding, circling and let them drop. Now, leaving your arms outstretched again or bringing them back into your lap, make small circles with your wrists in a gentle, fluid range. Gently open and close your hands, not overstretching, but a gentle, smooth movement. Now, take a slow and deep breath in, filling the lungs right to the base and breathe out slowly, feeling that letting go as you do. Sit yourself back down, making sure that your shoulders and back are relaxed, hopefully supported by your chair, and your hands are in a comfortable position in your lap or on the desk in front of you. Thanks, Marie. So, what can we do to make things more Minimising the impact, recommendations for survival. Findings from a longitudinal study undertaken with high school students who were provided with laptops and ergonomic training on optimal setup indicated that the use of an external keyboard and mouse resulted in reduced neck and shoulder pain and fewer headaches. This is where the use of an external keyboard and mouse can have a big impact on our effective use of mobile technology. The benefits of providing a separate keyboard and mouse is that it enables the user to vary the distance of their monitor, raise it to a more appropriate viewing height and ensures that the keyboard and mouse are positioned flat on the tabletop close to the seated position. In a similar study conducted with university students and their use of laptop computers in 2011, four key areas of relevance were identified. Firstly, provision of a laptop riser had a positive effect on reducing discomfort as this elevated the monitor to a more comfortable viewing position. That is, being able to look at the monitor without having to bend the neck forward. Secondly, Use of adjustable height chairs ensured that the seated position is comfortable, back is supported and hands are in line with the forearms for keen. Thirdly, daily laptop use of four hours or greater was confirmed as a risk factor. It is widely accepted that doing the same tasks for long periods, irrespective of what it is, can lead to muscle fatigue and discomfort. Therefore, sensible guidelines include taking regular short breaks from the mobile device and varying and rotating tasks throughout the day. Finally, it was recognised that in order to understand how to apply these principles, ergonomic training was required to educate on the most ergonomic setup and to reduce the likelihood of adopting postures that risk muscle fatigue and lead to discomfort and musculoskeletal disorders. So what are the guidelines for optimal use and setup? Let's begin with laptops. Use a laptop riser. Set up the laptop on a riser. As a general rule of thumb, 
optimal viewing height is with the top taskbar being at or just below eye level. In the absence of a stand, some simple improvised methods may assist, including using a lever arch file as a laptop stand or even resting the laptop on the transformer box of the power supply. Plug into a larger monitor, especially if using the laptop as a primary hard drive or for prolonged periods. Use a separate mouse and keyboard. Wireless is preferable. Select a comfortable mouse and consider the requirement for your keyboard. Optimise your display, considering not only increasing the font size, but ensuring that the contrast and brightness promote easy viewing. Laptop screens tend to be darker in colour and often need their default settings for power management to be changed to brighten these up. The general rules of ergonomic setup should always apply. Briefly, this means to consider the height of the desk and chair, ensure the legs and feet are supported, ensure that the arms are optimally positioned with elbows at 90 degrees and resting gently by the side of the body, ensure that the forearms are in line with the wrists and wrists remain neutral when keen. So now to using a tablet. Try to become comfortable using both hands when swiping, tapping and scrolling on a tablet so that alternating hands become second nature. When using your tablet in any configuration, whether it be positioned on a stand or on the armrest of your couch or propped up on a pillow, it is important to vary your posture every 15 minutes. Wherever possible, the use of an external keyboard and mouse is recommended. Many tablets are provisioned with a keyboard to which the tablet can be docked and undocked to. However, as per laptop use just discussed, this does not achieve an optimal ergonomic work setup. Wherever possible, avoid prolonged holding of the tablet to reduce the risk of joint related discomfort from prolonged gripping. Cases reduce the need to grip the tablet and a stand will improve head and neck postures during temporary tablet use. Case designs that facilitate the tablet being positioned in an inclined orientation will achieve better viewing angles. A tablet should not be maintained on your lap. Recent research by Chow and Wells felt, found that the maximum duration for holding a computer tablet with one hand was less than 10 minutes for many users. And as could be expected, the endurance of women was less than that for males, given differences in muscle mass and joint torque forces of the upper limbs. Similar conclusions were reached by Prera and her team, who recommended that the use of smaller to medium sized tablets was preferable to large options. A summary of their recommendations are listed here and are self-explanatory, so take a minute to read through these. Now for mobile phones. Sitting with back support, forearm support and head in a neutral position will minimise symptoms of neck pain. Avoid bending the neck to view the phone, rather raise it closer to eye level, gently bracketing the elbows against your body as per the picture on the screen. How many of us are still using those hands-free sets? There are ergonomic benefits for using hands-free and headsets which should be given consideration. Altering your texting style can help, such as using two hands to hold the phone, holding the phone with one hand and texting using the index and third finger on the other hand. Alternate hands. Limit the number and length of text sent and use predictive text or voice to text recognition applications. For visual relief and to minimise eye strain, the following is recommended. Make sure your display screen is clear. 
Position the screen at a comfortable distance and viewing height to avoid peering or hunching. Make the font bigger. Tilt the screen to improve the viewing angle. Put your glasses on. Don't wait until your eyes are sore or you have a headache before you take action. And ensure your prescription for glasses and contact lenses is up to date. Minimise glare in your working environment and equally ensure that there is sufficient lighting for computer-based tasks. Visual breaks involve, change, involve changing your focus on something to the, in the distance, such as out of the window or going for a walk. Visual exercises provide useful and simple to understand exercises to minimise eye strain and a couple of these will be listed at the end of the presentation. Finally, let's get physical. The mantra is vary the task, vary the posture. Take regular postural breaks. This is more important when using mobile technology devices than when sitting at your ergonomically set up workstation. Incorporate gentle exercises that involve trunk rotation, head rotation, relaxation of the arms and hands and also breathing elements. If experiencing any musculoskeletal symptoms, change what you are doing immediately. You are supposed to be comfortable at work. Remember, management of tendonitis and inflammatory conditions include changing the way the action is performed to reduce the loading on the affected muscles. Use reminder tools to take breaks throughout the day. This helps to break up tasks, gets you moving and lessens body fatigue. Time for another recap. It is important if the frequency of use is high, then you should consider the use of external equipment such as a mouse and a keyboard as well as stands. It is important to move regularly and take regular physical and visual breaks. So once again, let's review those postural break exercises. Let's have another go at these exercises. Backwards and drawing them down. Bring your shoulders forward, raise them up and drop them back down, feeling relaxed. Shrug your shoulders, bringing them up to your ears and focus on the letting go, letting them drop back and down. Try that again, bringing them up, holding, dropping back and down. And try to draw them gently together so that they meet in the middle of your back. Feel that squeezing in the middle of your back and you should feel an opening or a gentle stretching across the front of your chest wall. Now raise your arms to shoulder height and out to the side of your body, drawing small circles with your fingertips. You can leave your arms outstretched or drop them by your sides, but make some small circles with your wrist. Gentle rhythmical movement, not straining. Gently open and close your hands, moving your fingers out and back in a gentle, repetitive, smooth action. Now take a slow and deep breath in, filling your lungs right to the base and let the air out gently and slowly, focusing on letting go. Now sit back down, hope that you have some back support, right to the back of your chair rather than perching, making sure that your shoulders and back are relaxed and your hands are in a comfortable position in your lap or on the desk in front of you. Thanks again, Marie. Now for the last bits. I'm sure that these photos speak for themselves, so I'll let you have a giggle. Unfortunately, the use of mobiles whilst driving is an all too real issue and I think I can speak for the tech team when I say that as therapists working in a clinical rehabilitation roles outside of ergonomic practice, the number and seriousness of motor vehicle accidents occurring as a result of mobile use whilst driving are significant 
and the consequences are severe and forever life changing. Now a discussion on mobile technology would be incomplete without touching on portability. Typically we are all familiar with laptop bags and briefcases, however it is important to consider the weight and size of items being carried. That is, the weight of the device, its power cord, the separate keyboard and mouse or stand and it is not unusual for people to report shoulder, neck and back discomfort impacted upon by the carrying of heavy briefcases or even TARDIS sized handbags. If consider consistently using your mobile devices in a couple of locations, it may be effective to purchase a second power cord, keyboard and mouse so that you are not required to transport these between locations. The moving and handling requirement when transporting equipment over longer distances. Care is still required with all incidental lifting and carrying in and out of the car or up the office steps. Alternatively, the use of a supportive backpack is an option. These need to be provided with wide padded shoulder straps and a waist belt to distribute the load. The key for effective use of a backpack is correct fit and correct use. These are not of any benefit when slung over a single shoulder, rather weight needs to be evenly distributed. So to wrap up this presentation, this is mobile technology. Buyers and computer retailers and come in many shapes and sizes. These will be required to set up your external devices such as the keyboard and mouse. Laptop risers and tablet stands position devices more optimally. This Logic laptop station is complete with USB connected integrated keypad and cooling fan. There are a multitude of tablet stands available on the market. Those designed specifically for the brand of tablet and those able to be utilised in alternative configurations as per the stump pictured here. New technology is making being mobile much easier. Developments in wireless technology are happening at a rapid pace. Take for example this Bluetooth silicon keyboard available for less than $30 designed for use with all Android phones and tablets. The excuse that it is too hard or too heavy is not really valid. Set up a wireless mouse for portability. These are just two examples of the many options available. Or purchase an option that provides you with a combination of both. Keyboards with built-in touchpads. Other options to support tablet use when out of the office include hand straps to avoid prolonged gripping, tabletop and car mounting options as shown on the screen. Here are some stands and fixed monitor arms to support tablet use wherever we use them frequently. And finally, IKEA stands are a cheap and cheerful solution for those wanting an excuse for a shopping holiday. So, what are the key take home messages from today's presentation? We are not asking you to stop work, rather rethink the way you are doing things. So, strike a balance. Think about how long you are using your devices for, how are you using them and for what purposes. Be aware of your posture, consider your setup, vary your tasks and postures, move more. Use external devices, 
Remember, a keyboard and mouse can make a big difference to your posture and comfort. If all you take away from today's presentation is the ability to remember the impact that these little items alone have, you will be on a better path to optimising your posture and continuing to use mobile technology in the years to come. Setting yourself up correctly will become routine if you make a conscious effort to seek training and advice from qualified professionals. Here are the web resources promised during the presentation. So now I'll hand over to Marie and Liz to answer some questions. We have a question. The question is, assuming we have an office-based role, how often should we do the exercises Marie is doing? A very good, good crucial for workplace health from a number of different reasons. I can't give you a precise answer. However, I can say that Professor Leon Straker at Curtin University in Western Australia is one of the world leading researchers in musculoskeletal health for office workers. David Dunstan from the University of Sydney is doing world breaking research. Uh, sorry, Martin Mackey from the University of Sydney and Professor David Dunstan from the IDI Baker Research Institute in Melbourne. The research seems to indicate at the moment that we should optimally take a short break approximately every 20 minutes. However, it is not known at this stage how long we should break for. So I guess the grandmother clause is to take a short break regularly, aim for every 20 minutes, for a minute to two minutes at one time. And the exercises that I have taken you through are a very simple range of exercises that will not cause discomfort. If you have a musculoskeletal condition, it is likely that you may need to take shorter uh, breaks of um, more frequent duration. You may need to move every 10 minutes, for example. If you have a treating therapist, it's a good idea to talk to them about customising these simple breaks so that they are of best benefit to you. So in summary, move frequently, suggest every 20 minutes for one to two minutes, but be prepared to move a little bit more regularly. And you can do this during your work time uh, while you're reading a document on the screen. You don't have to hold your hands on the mouse and on the keyboard and you can incorporate these into your everyday tasks really right through the day. We have another question. What are the thoughts on software to get people moving? Once again, these software apps and programs are de being developed at a rate of knots. I might hand over to Danny to speak to this. Okay. Sorry, um, I can just give you a brief uh, range of these right now. Software uh, rest break reminder programs can be helpful, but they can also be annoying. And so you need to choose carefully to find the one that works for you. The, the more um, long standing ones that have been available for the long uh, uh, period of time include WorkPace, WorkRave, and Ergominder. More recently developed ones include ExoTime, Scirocco, and some of these come with their own exercises and some do not. If you're looking at a software rest break reminder program with generic exercises, be aware that the person who has designed this does not know your personal musculoskeletal condition. And so it's once again, it's wise to check these exercises with a treating therapist if you have a musculoskeletal condition and to do them carefully. If you experience any discomfort with these exercises, stop and get some advice. Other ways of using um, rest, break, um, exercise, uh, rest break reminders could be uh, to use a vibrate repetitive timer on your mobile phone 
or a simple desktop timer or to incorporate your work group so that in combination with your colleagues you take regular short breaks. And just in case you're concerned about getting your work done, research shows that frequent short micro breaks do not impact productivity. We have another question. Do you have an opinion on wearable devices and how they can motivate employees to increase movements such as walking meetings? It was interesting last week at the National Physiotherapy Conference that an exercise and fitness expert said the best form of exercise is the one that you will do. And so my answer to this question is whatever motivates people to get up and to move. All right, thank you, Marie, for that. We still have some time if anyone does want to um, submit some questions uh, for this morning's um, webinar. Um, while um, while we're allowing for that to happen, I'll just. Uh, run through some further information about uh, WorkSafe uh, Tasmania Month. As I said at the start, we are recording today's uh, presentation and other webinars that we are running during WorkSafe uh, Month and we'll make, make them progressively available on the, uh, the WorkSafe site at the end of WorkSafe Tasmania Month, which ends on the 30th of October. So do uh, have a look um, on the WorkSafe Tasmania website or if you have a copy of the WorkSafe Month program, please do uh, have a look at what else uh, we're, uh, we're offering in, in terms of uh, webinars, venue sessions um, as well. We do have a live feed session on um, tomorrow at the University of Tasmania. So uh, uh, do um, have a look in the program and if you haven't uh, registered to, uh, to attend that, then, uh, then please do. Um, and in the meantime, another question has come through. So the question is, um, I think it says, what are your opinion on standing workstation or desks? To answer that question will take quite a bit of time and will probably depend on the, individ on the individual situation. It's very favor fashionable at the moment for people to request an ergonomic assessment in order to be able to get a standing workstation or standing desk. And this is something at the tech team that we are asked all the time. However, it is not as simple as just standing. In fact, research shows that standing for prolonged periods can be just as problematic as sitting for long periods. To take an ergonomic perspective over whether people need to stand or to sit, you really need to factor in all the whole design of the work and the workplace and the person doing the tasks. For many people, it is still possible to incorporate standing and moving through their day without the need for a standing workstation. For example, it's possible to have standing staff meetings, walking meetings, and for all those incidental chat, chat, chats with colleagues to find an area in the office where it may be, you may be able to stand. Many offices have a workbench of about 920 millimetres height and while this won't be high enough to stand and read at, if you consider putting a small archive box or perhaps some phone books on that surface, you can create a temporary standing surface for non-computer work and you may find that you can get yourself standing five to ten minutes, an hour even, through the day. For people who are absolutely um, doing 100% of their work at their computer and cannot get up and move, perhaps they're in a timed work area like a smart centre or perhaps they're on a helpline, then considering spending part of the day standing at their desk can be helpful. Options. No one workstation suits all users and the cheapest is not necessarily the best. 
If you believe that you need to have a standing station, I think it's best to request an ergonomic assessment so that all options can be discussed and you don't go quickly to the default of just needed. All right, thank you for that, Marie. Um, no further questions have uh, have come through, so. Um at, uh, at that point, I will uh, thank the Tasmanian Ergonomic Collaborative for, uh, actually, hold on, <laughs> I'll take that back. I'll read this question out. Um, if I use two screens, should I have a main one straight in front of me? Sorry, the question is, if you have two screens, screen, should yes. you have the main screen in front of you? Yes. This presentation is essentially about um, mobile and laptop objects, and so the question is probably outside the scope of the presentation. However, in general rules, the body should be centred to the task, so that if one screen is used more than the other screen, place the more frequently used screen directly in front. If the screens are used equally, place them directly in front of the body so that it is equal range of movement looking from one to the other. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, Marie. Um, and as, as I was saying, um, we do certainly thank the Tasmanian Ergonomic Collaborative for participating in this morning's uh, webinar, Keyboard and Mouse, Little Objects, Big Impact. We also thank everyone who uh, participated by hooking into uh, today's webinar and uh, please do check out the WorkSafe Tasmania Month program of, event, of events on our website for further uh, upcoming uh, webinars uh, this week and over the next two weeks as well. And uh, as I mentioned at the start, you will receive a short survey to complete once this webinar is, uh, is closed down, so uh, do stay on your screens to <laughs> Uh, tell us about your webinar experience um, and uh, your thoughts on this morning's webinar. Uh, so thank you everyone and uh, do have a good rest of the day.